um, the concept behind this was to pick books that, well, first of all, that, you know, we selfishly, um, our community of preservationists want to read, but then to also pick books that are preservation adjacent. So the work of historic preservation is basically looking at the space that surrounds us and, you know, basically determining what do we value, what do we want to take from it and move it into the future. Um, a lot of people think historic preservation is like, stop progress, stop, you know, like hold the presses, preserve everything, encapsulate everything. But really, it's just, um, it's a, a way of um, understanding your environment um, and planning, planning for change. You know, it, when preservation is done right, there's quite a bit of change in preservation. So uh, the first book we did, we looked at um, Clint Smith's uh, How the Word is Passed, um, which is all about um, essentially mon um, uh, historic historical sites and how we interpret historical sites and the effect of our interpretation, what that says about us as a, as a nation, as a country. Um, and the second one was Braiding Sweetgrass. Um, and in that, it's uh, sort of a, um, I want to say, a way at looking at the natural world through an indigenous lens where um, your total concept of, you know, how you sit in your environment is kind of, I want to say 180 degrees different from what, what I was raised, whereas the environment is something that that you take from to support yourself and not necessarily that you give back to or have a reciprocal relationship with. And in that one, we in actually both of those, we brought in facilitators um, that we thought would really enhance the discussion. So um, the first one, we had Anthony Pratcher, who is a professor at ASU, who is writing a history of Black Arizona. Um, so definitely that was some really great moderation. And he, um, as a professor, has a really great style also of, of um, dialogue and we divided into breakout groups. Um, and in the second one, uh, we had Carrie, what is Carrie Cannon? And she is a ethnobotanist with the Walpi tribe. And so literally she does the same job as Robin Wall Kimmerer um where uh, she works with tribal nations to assist them in um, identifying first foods um and works with federal agencies to um advise on how to uh i want to say, I want to say control environments that's not the right word manage <laughs> manage conservation and environments in using more traditional ecological knowledge so those were great discussions this one you know we really couldn't think of who would have been a, a great facilitator and, and, and would have added, you know, kind of value to these essays. So I, I basically pulled the straw and said, Oh, I'll do, I'll do some, some facilitation. Um, and I, I hadn't read the book yet. I had just heard about it. Um, it's obviously been on the New York times bestseller list. And so, um, I was like, I want to read it anyway. I'm going to read it. So might as well. And what I didn't realize is it it's, it's not breezy. It, I mean, it's a series of essays, but it's it's a lot of essays. <laughs> and so to facilitate, it's like, wow, you know, like, do I pick a theme and like what theme is weaving through these essays or do we go essay by essay? I mean, it really is, um, it, it is a challenge. So I thought the way I would structure it, I had a couple general questions that were like provocative, um, just, you know, getting your thoughts on the overall exercise this author has done with the book and what you think this book contributes. Um, and I have to apologize. I have a super raging headache. So if I'm doing this a lot, it's like in my head. Um, and then um, I did have a couple thoughts on some of the essays. I believe um, you may have all read the Lasco cave paintings. Yeah. Okay. Um, Hall of Presidents. I have some thoughts on Hall of Presidents. And I also have some thoughts on Indianapolis as well. So I thought we could delve into that. Um, and it looks like a lot of us know each other here, <laughs> um, but just in case we don't, um, I'm Catherine. Uh, I am the State Historic Preservation Officer here in Arizona. I work very closely with Arizona Preservation Foundation uh, for a lot of the programming that we do in our outreach and education, um, and also for the conference that we are planning, which I need to remind public allies, you guys need to be at our conference again. 
we'll give you a table. Um, we're going to be down in Tucson this year in October. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll get some students. I, when we are able to do the conference during the school year, we are fortunately able to get students. Normally we do it during the summer and no students, but I know that's your prime recruiting period at Public Allies. So uh, that's of interest to you guys. Um, Teresa Cano is my coworker at SHPO. Uh, she's also a very dear friend of mine. And then Donna, you guys know Donna, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, no one love. <laughs> oh my gosh, <laughs> to know Donna is to love Donna. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. Um, and so can you guys, I, I, I know you guys are both with Public Allies, but I, I don't know what your backgrounds are that brought you there. Um, and then also, Jesse, we're going we're gonna to ask you to unmute and maybe introduce yourself in a bit as well. So Lou? Sure. Hi, everybody. Um, yeah, so I was in AmeriCorps uh, right after college, uh, but I wanted to be a teacher. So I did AmeriCorps and then I taught middle school English and history for seven years, uh, got burnt out and then found my way back to AmeriCorps um, to Public Allies. So yeah, I am now the Tucson co-director of Public Allies Arizona. So I live in and work in Tucson. Excellent. And Fong. Hey, everybody. Um, thanks for having me here. I'm Fong Lei, they, them. I also was in AmeriCorps and I came um, because Sarai um, shared with me a lot of the things that, that they and Lou were doing and it really aligned um, with what I'd always wanted to do after, especially after like coming out of the pandemic and stuff. So, um, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a great program. I I am so impressed. Um, I, you may get more of an influx of applicants because I'm I'm totally pimping you guys at state parks right now. I really feel like we should have um, we should not well AmeriCorps, but also Public Allies folks in the state parks. Um, there's just so much to learn. There's so much that we're doing and we're really trying to, um, under, uh, the new administration, we're trying to increase our, uh, diversity, inclusivity, and equity, um, programs within the parks. And I think that is also a very good fit for public allies. So, yeah, glad to have you guys as partners. Thank um, you, Catherine. And I want to say like, um, uh, by the way. I, I've been in your office like multiple times. Thank you for letting us get to use your office, your desk and everything. Oh, uh, really? I, have not, I, have, I, have <laughs> I don't remember you. that. <laughs> it's always been me, Mary Ellen, and Conrad. And we're like, oh, Catherine isn't here today, but uh, you know, she has a great room oh, yeah. for, for meetings. Yeah. No, my office is everybody's office. I've even had <laughs> people from other divisions coming in. It's the biggest office in the building. It's not. Cool. The, it's the most distracting office because quite frankly, you've got people walking all around. It's like a fishbowl and people are walking around the perimeter doing interesting things. Um, that's true. Yes. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. We've, we've seen many, I don't know what you say. It's not a, I don't know if you call it a crime. I mean, I guess there are felonies <laughs> that are being committed. <laughs> but, oh, that's okay. Yeah. All it's right. funny. Like I'll be at my computer and then like someone's like at the window and they're doing something because the window's reflective so they they can see themselves but not me <laughs> i'm like hey okay um so uh yes yes i think i freaked i don't know if it was I, 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 freaked them out. I don't know oh well, well sometimes you just want to be a lurker you don't want i mean it's seven o'clock at night you just don't want to be having to talk so i, I think that's just okay um, so I did a little bit of research. So John Green, you guys know he has a podcast, right? That this was a podcast. Apparently he had started up this podcast. Um, it's a venture joint venture with his brother. Apparently they're quite the personalities. They've done a vlog thing together, um, where I think they call themselves the vlog brothers or something. And, um, and they, they just seem very smart and current. He is my age. So he's, 
well, he's younger than me. He's like a couple of years younger than me. But so he's a 40 something dude, dad. Um, and, you know, he talks a bit about that in the book. Um, and he was a very popular was is he is a very popular young adult uh, fiction author. Uh, one of his books, which one is it, Teresa? Baltimore. Baltimore, Baltimore, Stars. Baltimore Stars was a feature length movie. Um, and he's had two other, I think, bestsellers as well. And they're kind of geared toward the, you know, 16, 17 year old crowd, I guess, um, which I always find interesting. Um, I haven't read the books. So I don't know if they're, they're written like third I, person. I first person. do know that that Alicia said she had read The Fault in Our Stars. Yeah, it's supposedly very, very sad. It's about two kids with cancer who meet each other in treatment for cancer. I don't think everybody lives, but maybe they do, I don't know. But hmm. So um, so anyway, this apparently he, he also struggles quite a bit with anxiety and writes very frankly about his struggles with anxiety um and being in therapy and being medicated um and you get a little bit as you read in this book as well you get a little sense of that as he's introducing some of these subjects later on um i guess what i wanted to ask is uh i i when i was looking at this it, it uniformly gets great reviews it's a number one new york times bestseller uh, one reviewer said, this is not the type of book you just read straight through, which is what I did, which is maybe why I was getting derailed. This is a book that I think they said it's like coffee table reading, bathroom reading, you just pick up and you do a couple chapters at a time. Um, I had one reviewer said that this was a memoir. And that's what I wanted to talk to you guys about and just like, how does, what do you think about this as a memoir? Like, do you think it I mean, if it is a memoir, I think it's pretty artful. Um, like, can you write a memoir that is really about a collection of phenomena? Well, I can see where this would be and a type of memoir because it really reflects his age. Um, and as I, I make no bones about it, I am so much older, that most of these things that he wrote about were, are, are, and were not something that I thought about. So I, I gave one example of Haley's comment and said, it wasn't something that I really even kind of dwelled on if I was like his age, because it hadn't happened. I mean, it was going to come, but there were so many other uh, space oriented things that if I was going to write in my memoir, I would have written about um, Sputnik and the landing on the moon and things like, like that. So yeah, I can see where it could be a memoir and I've made a list of things that I would have written about that so were very different from what he wrote about. So you think that the very list of things that he is journaling on mm -hmm. is a function of his age as a late forties man. That's right. how I, that's how I see. It. Oh, okay. So I guess maybe then the question I'll tear off of is what would you write about? Like. Got my list. How many, oh, she's got. <laughs> Oh, did you also do the stars? Did you say how many stars that they would eat? Well, you know, I didn't, I, I, I was really amused by that. And, and there's, I don't even remember which chapter it is when he talked about how many books he signed. I think it was 200,000. Well, you know, then I went well, back and I paired, anyway. never really paid attention, but this is a library book and it is signed. Yeah, he said that, um, and so again, if you guys don't mind spoilers, that um, he made a commitment that he was going to sign every book that was produced. Um, and so what the publisher did was send him like the title page or whatever page you sign. And he just kept, he had a big sheaf of them and he was just signing them. And he said it was very therapeutic and he got to work on his signature and perfect his signature. And 
he's got a good J. It's a very authoritative. I mean, it, sounds like, like, it sounds like a nightmare to me, but I mean, I think that's also to him some, he said, here's some insight into my particular neuroses that this is actually calming for me. <laughs> um, was it for this specific book that he signed all of them or? Yes, yes. He no, about no well, he's writing it. He's writing about it. So I don't, maybe it wasn't this way. I don't know. I, no, it's and it's it's on a blank page. It's the on a blank page. Yeah, maybe. It, it, yeah, you're right. He's writing about it, so then it wouldn't be this book. I don't think. So I have this. The turtles all the way down, and this one's signed. It's signed. Oh. Yep. And, well, my, and this book it. of mine is. I mean, like I said, it's a library book, but yes, it is signed. Yeah. Well, I. I I think that says something about his character, like, you know, like, I want to give you a personal reading experience, I'm going to sign this book. But I, I but I was amused by his ratings, you know, giving them them stars. I mean, I think th that that was a very unusual um, technique and, and a kind of a subtle commentary on how he felt about something, which at times, maybe I want to go back and reread that and going, did he give me clues <laughs> that he was only going to rate it, you know, a three stars or a two stars? And if he only rated it, if he rated it low, then the question would be, why was he writing about it? Yeah, and and I have to confess, I think it would always surprise me how many stars he would give. Like, not always, but like, I'd be like, wow, it didn't sound like that you're a super fan and, and it would get like a three or four stars. And I'm like, man, when I don't like something, there's no, three stars is not, no. And he gave me, and, and he totally did not make use of the zero stars, which yeah. I think is a very valuable rhetorical tool <laughs> in this day and age to be emphatic, like the zero stars do not recommend. And we didn't see any zero stars in there as well, which is interesting. Okay, but we need to see your, hear your list, Donna, seeing as you made. Oh, well, I, my list, and this is not, um, you know, my, 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 the whole phrase of duck and cover bomb drills. Hmm. I mean, that was really significant. Now, I not only had them in, in, elementary school in the States, but I lived in Japan for a year. So we had bomb drills there because we were really close to Korea. Ugh. You know, we had them actually growing up as well. So I did duck and cover drills until probably, so I'm almost 50. So I did duck and cover drills probably till like fifth grade, I wanna say. Yeah, but I don't remember them much after elementary school which are kind they're kind of messed up i mean that's super messed oh, yeah. up that we lived in this sort of space of fear where someone was going to drop a nuclear bomb on us but you know the contemporary analog is the um oh gosh, what is it? active shooter drill active shooter drill sorry yeah and my kids are so well versed i'll tell you we had a situation um teresa knows about this last summer where we had a break-in in our house that we were in it was during covid it wasn't last time. god two summers uh, it was two, like yeah. two summers ago and um it was a weird situation it was a guy who was on drugs and he was actually quite pathetic i mean he when we got over the initial scare i mean it was obvious he wasn't going to present harm to us um, but the kids immediately went into active shooter mode. They put themselves in the front bedroom. They closed, the, they locked the door. They turned off the lights. They went into the closet. They called 911. These kids just knew how to do it. And meanwhile, I'm all like, <laughs> what do we do? I'm like yelling at the guy, go outside. Um, yeah, that, that is definitely, I, that's essay worthy, I think. Yeah, well, I think that was essay worthy. And then landing on the moon was, to me, was essay worthy, or just all the space, the Sputnik and, and all the space. Race. Although he did have one on space, um, which was his one on space? Well, 
It was, oh, I don't remember. I mean, he had Haley's comment, but. Yeah, he had one where he was talking about a Russian cosmonaut that had to take all the air out of his. Oh, right, 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 to get back. To get back into, um, I yeah. think it was, it was toward the end, I want to say it was, yeah. I don't know. God, see, that's the thing. There's so many of them that it really, they all do kind of tend to blur together. Yeah, they, they do. I mean, there are things, you know, and this is not everything, but Agony and Ecstasy by Irving Stone was a monumental book when I read that because I decided I wanted to learn how to sculpt. I have that book. I have not read it. It's on my shelf. Well, Irving Stone was quite the uh, historical fiction writer. He and Thomas Costain, and my mother read those. I read those. Um, they're not the best, but they were really what you found in the 50s and the 60s. It's about Leonardo da Vinci, right? No, Michelangelo. Okay. Yep, see it. Obviously. Anyway, anyway. I mean, so that that was just, it was it was monumental. I never did sculpt. I mean, I made sculptures out of concrete. Um, and while he talked about Super Mario Kart, which I really don't know what it is other than maybe a video game. For me, live bands at school dances, junior high and high school, were really a big deal because my kids never experienced that. And I don't know if any of you ever experienced it, but we never had records. We always had live. We had roller skating um, parties where they would take our high school gymnasium and they would bring the local roller skating people in and they'd have disco lights and a ball and we would mm -hmm. roller skate. You had yeah. Tracy, you had that too? That's pretty cool. Great skate. You, but you actually went there. They didn't bring it to your school. Oh, um, yeah, we went there. Yeah, they brought the my butter. shit to our school. <laughs> which was also a little traumatizing if you were like the chubby like homely kid who like they kept doing like what is it partner skate or something and you're like <laughs> um oh i figured out the one about space it was um it was the one about oh shoot orbital sunrise which is a bonus essay that's in i don't know if you're going to get to that lou in the um no, in the paperback. So I don't know if it'll be in the um, audiobook. But uh, the orbital sunrise, basically, what he's saying is, you know, we experience sunrise once a day, but in space, the astronauts experience sunrise once every, I want to say, he said 15 hours or something like that, just because of the orbit, the way they're doing the orbit. And um, that when, um, this particular um, mission, it was a Russian mission that went awry. It was the first unmanned, or not unmanned, was it first spacewalk, not on the moon. Um, and something bad happened and they were kind of put into a flat spin as they had to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And so they were whipping around in a circle. And then meanwhile, they're whipping around a circle, but they're also in orbit. So the sun is rising and setting, <laughs> rising and setting. And they described it like um, almost like a strobe effect or a disco light. And he's like, you know, just the concept of, of a sunrise and a sunset being this peaceful thing that you watch. But when you're in space, it's more of a. It's every uh, 90 minutes. It's every ni 90 minutes. Really? Oh, crap. Yeah, it says. Uh, that they that Scott Kelly experienced over or nearly eleven thousand sunrises during his uh, stay nice. on the international. And then, what does that do for sunrises? Like, if it's not marking a day, what the heck is it doing? I don't know. <laughs> like, and I, I found value to this book where it would just pose little questions like that. You know, like, you're like, oh, okay. I, I, you know, when I think about the one I would do as far as review is because um, there was actually one essay that made me think quite a bit, which one I was on the, on the internet. Well, I like 
one on academic decathlon because I learned about academic decathlon actually back when I met Anthony Proctor. Um, so, because it didn't exist, it's not that old. When my kids were in school. Oh, it existed when I was in school. Yeah, but my kids are older than you. They're in their 50s. Yeah. So I love the I love the chapter on the internet because it, it totally grabbed what the internet was when I first experienced it with like AOL. You got your little <laughs> AOL address. You had a, a modem with a dial up and it made sounds and it was really weird. And um, and then I remember this weird thing called Google and like that was weird. And I, I think I remember Amazon and it was like a bookstore. And I'm like, why do we need an online bookstore? What he didn't, um, you know, really pursue. Is I think Amazon should have been one of these. I feel like Amazon has totally just, I feel like it's our demise. I feel like it's like, well, we, it's, it's, Walmart. It's, it's Walmart. No, it's worse though. No, 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 but I mean, it's, 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 yeah, it's in the same, they're, they're kissing cousins. Like there was a section that he was talking about and I, I just, it really like blew my mind. I was thinking about it for like almost an entire evening where he was talking about and simply finding the notes here. Um, about, oh, the internet, here it is, about essentially how in the early years you had to opt in to go into the internet, right? You had to like go and sit at your computer and listen to the modem go boo, 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 boo. So now in order to get away from the internet, you have to like opt out so consciously that it's almost really impossible. And the thing about the internet, and this is the link for me with Amazon, is I feel like the entire internet sometimes is just there to turn us into consumers. Like that's its only function. Like my search browser, my Google knows everything about me. It knows what my fears are, you know, cause I'm like, you know, like, oh, what's this strange bump I have? Or like, I'm, I have numbness in my fingers. So it, it knows what I'm like searching for medically. It knows where I like to eat, what restaurant, I mean, everything is in that search bar. And you connect that to, um, you know, uh, Jeff Bezos and his little crowd. And now since they know everything about me, all I am to them is someone to target to for advertising, target to, to consume like everything. And, and I, I mean, what does that mean when that's all we are in the end of the day, we're just consuming. That's, that's all. That's all we're doing. Like, yeah, we're using this tool to give us more information or to entertain us, but in the end, it's just to make us a consumer so that 1% of the population can get really, really rich and the 99% just completely struggle. And unless you're gonna opt out of that, you are a part of that problem. I don't know. I can't opt out, I'm like all in. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have thoughts on that. Well, that's one of the reasons why I don't have a cell phone. Oh, you don't? Nope. Uh -huh. Everything you do is on a landline. That is correct. Now I use the internet because I, yeah. I'm researching and everything, but um, yeah. No, don't have a cell phone. So that's that's my half opting out. I mean, I don't think I can ever do it. I think I'm I'm just done for. <laughs> yeah, it's also like a constant reminder of like when you don't have you don't make a large salary and you get inundated with all these like ads and things you want and places people go trips whatever and it's just like a constant reminder of like oh I, i'm not worthy enough or i'm no i'm not worth enough to like to consume or whatever so 
But you are, they're still targeting you. They're still targeting me, but I mean, on a personal level, it's like a constant source of like anxiety and fuel for depression, I guess. <laughs> Especially yeah. like in the COVID time, because you're like home and you're like in your house and you want to like consume, consume, consume just to like have some connection with like the outside world but at least in my case but see i mean like the internet during covid saved a lot of people from depression and loneliness yeah um, if you were creative yeah people were creative with it too so i mean it's a it's a complex tool and and i find that his most engaging essays really were when he would delve into a topic that had some element of uh, ambivalence about it, right? Like, you know, this is, could be good, but we've, we've evolved to use this technology and um, now it has me questioning what my role is. And I, I, those, I think, were the essays that I enjoyed the most. Um, well, it's like true, of like TikTok, because like, during COVID, everybody was so creative with TikTok, and you like went there to like watch these like creative little things. And then now it's like, oh, they were just sourcing all your information. So still, I was just like this like little cog in there, <laughs> you know. And now you can't even use. Well, I mean, you can, but we can't use. Yeah, I don't TikTok. know. If you guys, I don't know ASU. No, ASU probably isn't banned from from TikTok. Um, but the state of Arizona. Is. Oh, I think they are because U of A is. Really? The university? Yeah. Oh. For or like official stuff, we can't. Huh, I didn't realize that. Okay, well, there you go. Um, okay, so some of these, some of these um, essays did have some tangents to historic preservation. Um, it was interesting to me, and Lou, I think you said you're at the Hall of Presidents right now, but there's a line at the end of the essay on Hall of Presidents, and so he's basically, um, he's reviewing this, um, and and you know this, Teresa, by being a Disney fan, it's the, um, well, this is at Disney World, it's an exhibit of all of the uh, presidents, and they're basically animatronic, you know, talking wax models and they're giving like i think lincoln gives a gettysburg address and they're just you know basically all there and um and it really is sort of a dated exhibit and it's not very popular and so green is questioning like why is it even still there and what he kind of distills it to is that um the hall of presidents represents corporate america combined with uh, the mythology of greatness, American greatness, and that it is essential to have that on display to remind uh, visitors of, you know, why we are great. And he, he very, in a passing sort of quote says, you know, it's the same, same thing we do with architecture. Like, why do we have this monumental architecture that's pretty much like um, Greek and Roman revival architecture? Like if you go to Washington, D.C. And it's, again, to, to remind the observer that the United States is monumental. It is here to stay, that our architecture is the stuff of permanence. Um, I don't know if you guys had any thoughts on that, but I... I think architecture in a sense, like you could do an entire book where you, you know, review architecture and you know what its what its purpose is and what different styles evoke. Like what does it mean when you live in a historic home versus a contemporary home? Um, I don't know. Well, is don't get me started. Oh. <laughs> I'm trying to get you started. <laughs> You're trying to get me started. Well, you know, that is an interesting thing because of what I see in architecture today is that I suspect 
that most of the architects do not know how to draw without using a computer because they've always drawn on a computer. The, there seems to be a lack of creativity and architects don't seem to have quite the control over design and it all looks alike. So when, in, particularly I would say, if you remember the song back in the 60s of the Tiki Tacky Boxes, which was talking about Daly City, California, we have Tiki Tacky Towers in Phoenix. They all begin to look exactly alike. Now I contend part of the problem is that we have no design review and subsequently the developers from around the country know that Phoenix will accept any problem that is presented to them. And consequently, they all look alike and they don't seem to be cognizant of the environment we are in. So we've got all this glass that faces west and that faces south no protection of the glass and they say well it's you know it's got a certain rating and i'm going yes and i bet you if you hold your hand up against the window right now it's going to be hot you know just yeah well with it's, regards to the the residential um multifamily that's going up right now all over the they call them the four over ones it's like basically yeah. in a retail um, there's a risk they call those housing products. They're not even no. like communities or buildings. They're, they're a product and they're, they're also sold like a commodity. So the developer puts it up and then immediately sells it to an operator, which is one of, I think there's like five or six big ones in the West that operate all of this um, multifamily communities. Um, and there's no connection between who designs this building and what becomes of this building post construction. Um, yeah, it's, it's really problematic. Um, and I agree with you, Donna, they've certain cities have abdicated design review and, um, and by virtue of doing that, they've abdicated uh, creating civic spaces in their communities. There's, I mean, we have whole cities here in Arizona that don't have downtowns. There's no like third space. There's no civic commons. If you, if you go out to Buckeye, like Buckeye, there's nothing out there. There's, there's residential housing and strip malls and that is it. There's no like, I don't know, they may not even have a library. I don't know. They, they do have a library. I've been there. <laughs> but it's not located in any central space. No, like it's, not in, it's not in what you would call a civic. A civic. Yeah, like every, every community should have a civic core, a place where, you know, you can come together and, you know, walk around, grab a cup of coffee, exchange ideas, go see a play, go get a book out of the library, go visit government. Like there's a core. Um, and we have cities here in Arizona that, that don't even have that. They're just driven by corporations. I mean, the residential housing is driven by corporations too. Um, this, it's frightening. It really is. Um, yeah, I would, I would add that to this book. I would, I would add uh, looking at four over one housing development. As, as you know, but you know, I'm now I'm giving, I'm just like sitting here and I'm giving one stars to things. I'm trying to think about the four star stuff. I don't know. I'm talking a well, lot. I, I, I'm, preservation can have maybe not a four star. Sometimes it's only a two and a half, depending on where you are. But the whole idea of preservation, which is not that old when it's been made official it's been codified you know is a, is a big it's a big thing for this country 
And when you have people come to Arizona and say, well, we have no history and you're going, oh yes, we do. It's just maybe not as old as what it is on the East Coast or what it is in a, another country. We all have history and there are reasons to be protective of that history and to celebrate it and to make sure that it's the previous histories aren't forgotten either, just because we are making new histories. He has some really interesting quotes about history that I wrote down here, which um, I, I don't know if I agree with them, but he actually pulls out, and this is in the chapter, this is one coming up on, you guys haven't read it yet, Three Farmers on Their Way to a Dance. And he's basically analyzing a historic photograph and just thinking about history. And he has several quotes. He says, Philip Roth, Philip Roth on history. History is um, the relentless unforeseen, where everything unexpected is chronicled in the pages as inevitable, which I think what he's trying to say is that history is written by, um, history is by necessity written by folks in the present about the past. So you know what's going to have happened when you are writing history, you're, you're chronicling the inevitable. How did we get here today? So by virtue of that, you're, you're putting your own spin. Uh, then he quotes Kurt Vonnegut, history is full of surprises. Um, it can only prepare us to be surprised again. And I really like that one. That was, I think, everyone always says history repeats itself. Like, you know, like, don't be, don't be surprised. It's coming back. But I think when you're experiencing history, it is a surprise. And we forget. And it will surprise us again. <laughs> um, and then he also quotes Anais Nin. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. Again, so the inherent subjectivity in history. There's no, there's nothing that is discursively, objectively happened. It's what we believe happened. And then his own summary of all of that is history presses into us, shaping contemporary experience. History changes as we look back on the past from different presents. So I thought that was really cool, just the concept of there is no historical truth. It's completely, and I think that that in itself is, is the case for preservation um, because a building is tangible. <laughs> um, an archeological site is tangible. I mean, you ask, um, you know, folks from the, uh, Salt River Pima Maricopa Indian community. And they will be able to say, you know, it's not just oral history. We know where these places are. They still exist on the landscape. Um, I don't know. Well, I think one of the other the other things about about that is that it he does what he does say, and it's whether we accept that is that we are viewing history each through our own experiences, our own cultural upbringing, and that impacts how we interpret it and whether, uh, and how it, uh, not only interpret it, but how it impacts us and how it surprises us or doesn't surprise us where it might surprise someone else. Yeah, I want to go back to something I think Fong wrote in the chat. And Fong, you had wrote something about Instagram effect. And did you want to explain that? Because I, I think I know what you're talking about, but I'm not sure. Just for context, that was, uh, I was mentioning that when Teresa, when you were having the conversation about the internet and it's, you know, the effects that it's had on human society and Teresa was talking about how like oh it also reflects I mean it makes me think it makes me kind of feel bad that there's all these things that they're selling to me and I can't 
you know, buy most of them, right? And it makes me think about like famous, robust finding that the, the social media companies themselves have um, found, but didn't initially disclose was that like, for instance, adolescent femmes, like their self-esteem craters um, when they get exposed to um, the internet. I'm mean, not the internet, so social media actually is what is what their findings were. In this, this case, I think it was Facebook that found that. And the Instagram effect is how with all Instagram's filter, they're famously like these nice filters and people living their best lives and everybody else looking at that in their feed and just feeling like, oh, well, my life's kind of shitty. Compared to theirs, it just it doesn't measure up. Although I have to say, as a parent of a 15-year-old girl, I am pleasantly surprised at how much more enlightened she is and savvy she is about um, body. And I don't know if it's the Gen X's and the millennials that have influenced this, but I mean, it's definitely not from, or not Gen X, did I say Gen X? Gen Z, the Gen Z's, it's definitely not coming from Gen X. I mean, we are all body shamed, I mean, always. And, you know, and she is very quick to point out like, you know, the use of filters or the use of um, language that is body shaming or fat phobic or anything like that. She is like onto it. In fact, I get called out routinely if, you know, I'm having a bad day and I say, oh, I feel so bad. And, you know, like, or um, if she sees me watching what I'm eating in a not constructive way, she'll be like, I, I'm called now an almond mom, which apparently is a thing. A what? An almond mom. An almond mom. Almond moms are Gen Xers who are deathly afraid of getting fat and afraid that their kids they are going to get fat. <laughs> so, so whenever a kid is hungry, they will suggest the snack be almonds. <laughs> oh, that comes from that comedian i bet that blonde comedian makes this who's that then jokes i don't know I but, I'm, but i've been fully accused because my snacks suck in my house that they're not good enough and that i'm an almond mom and you know the subtext is all bodies are good bodies and you know you need to just chill chill out mom so <laughs> So they're getting there. I think the kids are lashing back at Instagram, I guess, is is where I'm going. Um, you know, interesting, when you said Instagram effect, I was thinking of something totally different. And this is an interesting um, Instagram effect for conservation and preservation. Um, do you guys know what the most Instagrammed image in the world is? The world. The horseshoe? Horseshoe bend. Yeah. Where she bend in Arizona. Um, basically that segment of the Colorado River that has that big twist in it and everybody goes. Have you guys been up there? Mm -mm. Yeah, it's a parking lot. You have to park your car and pay 10 bucks and you walk out. Not quite single file, but it's like a small trail and you get to the end and you take a picture, take a selfie. And that's how you experience Horseshoe Bend. And uh, Last year, I went to go take one of my favorite hikes that was like my most favorite hike when I lived in Flagstaff 25 years ago in Sedona. It's the hike over at um, Devil's Bridge. You guys know that one? It's like a, it's a natural rock arch. And I noticed that it was jammed with parking at the trailhead. I mean, super jammed and like there was improved parking where before you just kind of pulled over to the side of the road. And I was like, oh, there must be like something going on. The trail was jammed. And when we got to the top by the arch, it was like such a huge traffic jam. And you had to wait kind of like on the side of a cliff while each person went over the bridge and got their Instagram shot of themselves. There was no enjoying the nature. There was no like let's look at the view it was very manic and unpleasant and ruined really um and it's just such a weird thing from a preservation we're, we're dealing with it right now in our site steward program where the site stewards want to um, put pictures of the sites that they're monitoring up on the internet on facebook and we're 
we had to develop a new policy and you can't do that because we don't want these places to be Instagram to death. We don't, we don't want that to be the thing. And um, it's just interesting. I never thought we, that would be a preservation challenge for us. The Lasco chapter really kind of talks about that, how with the cave in Lasco, um, this is in Lasco, France. It's uh, one of the first evidences of, of rock art in the world, um, earliest rock art that um, is so popular and that the damage that would be done by people even just breathing in the cave space. They had to essentially shut the cave down and replicate, make another cave. <laughs> That's not Lasco, but it's a replica cave that people can actually visit and say they've been to Lasco, which is like, have you been to Lasco if you're in the replica cave? I don't know. I don't think so, but it's a better alternative than destroying heritage. So that was probably the one I think that was the most preservation or one of the ones that was most preservation focused. Yeah, I, I, I found that to be really interesting because I think about even the caves that we have here and then the caves that I have, have been in um, as the use increases, what's going to happen? Are they going to face that a similar thing and, and have to close it off or restrict the number of people that can go? I mean, it's the definition of the Anthropocene, right? You know, like, I mean, we are, by our very existence, we modify the world around us. It's not a bad thing. We have to. We're humans. We have to make our way in this world, but we're going to have to live with some of the consequences, I suppose. Well, that was dark. Okay, well, <laughs> we, are, we are hitting the eight o'clock hour. I don't want to keep you guys much longer, but I do want your feedback on, generally feedback on the book and the types of books you think would be really great to introduce. Like I would love, since public, I'm coming up with an idea. We have our books set for, for next month, but I'm wondering if public allies might want to facilitate one of these and choose a book and moderate. What do you guys think about that? And contact me. And friend. we could cross promote. So this could be a, a book on, um, you know, something related to DEI and public service, a book on, I don't know, finding yourself through volunteerism. I don't know. I Just love this idea. I'm the timing's not perfect though because we're about to graduate all these allies no 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 it would be months from now because okay, we, okay. we have um we have our books set we actually have our books set through the entire year yeah so um next month alicia picked the book okay and, and i got i can share on the screen it's sci-fi which is yeah interesting technically not my jam but somewhat dystopian she said which is my jam so i think yeah. So, so this is in August. We're going to be in the city. We is that showing on your screen? It is. It is. Yeah. And then in October, we are doing um, our okay. book club in conjunction with our conference, and that book is going to be um, Lydia Otero's La Calle which is a book about the barrio in Tucson and its destruction because of urban renewal and the construction of the Tucson Convention Center, which is where we're having our conference. So it's a very complicated history and hopefully she will be working with us to facilitate. So she's the actual author of the book and that is in October. So we have August and October and did we choose December? Yes. We did. I don't, I, right offhand, I don't recall. I think, I think it might be the a water light. knife. It was going to be a light book. Yeah, I think we were going to do The Water Knife by Paolo Basagalupi, um, which is, again, a dystopian book set in Phoenix in the future in which water, um, we've used all the water, and the only um, folks that have water now are the tribes. <laughs> and so the tribes have all the power. And um, it's an interesting book and an interesting take on what Phoenix could become. Um, and, but we can swap that one out. We haven't advertised that one. So um, it, 
December is maybe a good time for you guys. And you can think about a book. We'd love to, to do partnerships. In fact, now that I think about it, I think the success of this enterprise of book club may be us partnering with various um, preservation adjacent organizations to get more uh, readership. So, and we usually do it every, we're doing it every, every month. You're so. not being ambitious. It's too hard. It's too hard for people to read that are working all day long. We're finding. <laughs> well, I would love to partner. Um, yeah, some month down the road. That would be really cool. Okay. Cool. You can communicate with me because once Leisha deserts us, it'll fall on my shoulders. <laughs> well, we have to we'll have to see what the next crop of also uh, uh, public allies gives us. I think we have Conrad for another year. I think. I'm not sure. Do you guys know? I think that's the plan. I have heard that that is the plan. Yeah, I think that's the plan. He is one upping. He's um, I haven't seen him in a while. I think he's in the field. We sent he is. Him. He's at field yeah. school. He's been at field we school. Him, for, we sent him to field months. school. Yeah. <laughs> I saw him today. We had lunch with him today. Oh, you did? He said okay. he was doing good. So, yeah. He, he likes it, right? Mm -hmm. I knew he would. He's like flying a drone. I don't know. He's doing stuff. So, very good. Okay, guys. Well, this was lovely. Um, intimate but um but also really lovely and i hope you guys enjoy the rest of the book and i am going to go lie down and yeah i was gonna say thank you for facilitating <laughs> Catherine. I, hope, I, I, was, I actually started typing out this this thing where i was like oh Catherine, please feel free to to rest to step back rest to go no, lie down log good. off that's okay like we'll, we would have been fine we would have been fine i know you felt I responsibility am, i am very stubborn i don't quit easily <laughs> some may say i'm i'm hard to kill <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will talk to you guys later. Thank you. Tell, Bye. tell, tell Bye. the amazing Mary Ellen I said hello. I will. <laughs> Donna, you know I'm a big fan of yours. Oh yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for your pers that perspective. I loved it because I, I, you're right. Like shifting out of that, like the, these these events that shaped him that he's reviewing, are like not touch points for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I enjoyed it, but it was just, I'm going, I'm not, they didn't mean that much to me. <laughs> <laughs>